thanks for showing up uh, again in the morning. Uh, it's always, uh, it's always uh, I feel like I was just here too. But uh, so, okay, so today will be part two of, uh, of representing behavior. So this will be the sort of a natural continuation over what we talked about last time. Um, and so let's just recap that quickly and then we'll get into what we're going to talk about this time, which is what happens when you don't have a worm. What? I know, right? <laughs> um, all right. So, so basically, if you remember last time, what we essentially did is we had pictures of a worm. So we had data. And those data, in this case, were images, right? So we had images of of the worm moving around. And then from there, so we took that data, and from there, we had a high D posture. Right? And so that was like that set of 100 angles that we parameterized that worm with. Right? So we decided to go from data, and we made a decision here to parameterize the data in terms of high dimensional posture. Then from the high dimensional posture, we went from there to a low D posture. And this was through PCA slash finding that there was a phase. And this was for choosing the center line. From the low D posture, we then created a dynamical representation. And that was through these Langevin uh, dynamics. And from the dynamical representation, we had what I call a behavioral representation. And that would be, for example, the fixed points of that representation, or, or say, the limit cycles, like what you saw for the forward motion case. And then obviously from here, the goal is to make predi predictions and other measurements. <laughs> So all of this relied on the idea that we could create this sort of representation from this relatively simple body plan. Right? We had a worm. We could draw a center down the middle of it. And then that led to a lot of choices. Right? And we did. Each one of these things was a choice, a well-informed choice, but a choice nonetheless. And this was aimed at getting at certain aspects of the problem. And sort of why I've titled or subtitled my talk today, Mistakes Were Made, because we're going to talk about how one actually goes about making these choices for an animal where it's a little bit less clear. And it's not, so I presented the worm as if it was just like the straightforward path. I'm sure that Greg has a much more meandering story of how it actually occurred. But if you think about what's happening when things get a little more complicated, so say you've got an animal, and this will be the hero of most of today, a little fruit fly, running around doing crazy things. It's got wings, it's got, it's got six legs, each with, each with four degrees of freedom. It's got two wings, each with three degrees of freedom. It's got an abdomen it can bend in two ways. Its head can move around like this. They can do a lot of complicated things. And how you actually, there's no center line equivalent to representing this guy. And then from there, not only that, the idea is maybe this is also higher dimensional. So a lot of the tricks that we were able to work here had to do with the fact that we could represent it as a one dimensional vector or as one dimensional object. And this is for a fly. For a fly, you could sort of think quickly if you were really good at image tracking, you could track the location of all the wings and all this stuff. But now, oops, weird. I didn't realize there was sound on these. That's what happens when you rip videos off of YouTube and, and play it with your computer on mute. <laughs> so let's take the sound off. It's probably this one. Yep. Yoink. <laughs> 
All right. Hopefully this will be quiet. Good. <laughs> All right. So the idea is now you have even more complicated objects. Like you have not only the fly and the worm, but now you've got a mouse, say a mouse up here crawling around. You can have even social behavior like this cute little river otter or a jellyfish, which just m makes my head hurt, of how you're, actu you're going to actually go and represent this object. And people do this. And there's actually a whole bunch of really interesting work on it. But just trying to take the lessons you would take from the worm to the jellyfish becomes a very different beast. And this isn't even the worst case scenario. Imagine this, guys. This is a hydra. Let's look at this for a minute. And this isn't even the worst it can do. Right? This thing can grow limbs off of it. So its topology changes as a function of time. So, that's, so this, is actu this is actually would be my homework for you guys, is come up with a representation for this. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and, so the, and so the question is, so how can we actually like, think about this? Because right? we, we're physicists here. And what we want to do is come up with general principles. We study the worm, not just because the worm is interesting. The worm is intrinsically interesting in and of itself. But we also want to be able to study these things in a way so we can take our lessons across organisms. And so we'd like to try and see if we can come up with a formalism which doesn't rely, is explicitly on sort of this, the morphology of the animal. Yeah, Ilya. Well, let, okay, let's say we had a 3D image. Um, fine. 3D images are still going to be broken by multiple camera two dimensional mm -hmm. What I'm trying to, to say is maybe with this two dimensional image, I can try to calculate a conformal map from, a, and this can be unique, right, from a ball or from a circle to whatever the contour of this object is. And then that map is my representation of the, of the body posture. Right, but so but then you run into the problem of, even if you do that, right? So let's say, so, and we're going to be working in, in the regime today of we have infinitely good experimentalist friends, right? This is the, this is the, like, we, we can measure infinite amounts of infinitely perfect data of whatever we want. Not what, right? So this, this is sort of the regime we'll be working in. And for working with flies and worms, it's actually not such a bad approximation. Uh, there's, uh, you can take a lot of these data very, very cheaply. So I think for, for the Hydra, one of the things that, to me, is let's say you had the whole 3D object. Right? Because looking at just a 2D conformal structure sort of makes me a little bit nervous because of the fact that you now have this rotational problem and its structure is intrinsically 3D. Right? It's not, it's, it doesn't live on a plane. A fruit fly is also intrinsically 3D, but it also has an intrinsic orientation. Um, and so actually thinking about how to do this in a way, and it probably is, I agree, something topological is how you would have to represent it. And this actually might get to, I can't remember whose point it was yesterday, about looking at like measuring all the distances within the object or something like that. You could do that. But the point is, is that we want to be able to not just do this, but to be able to do all of these things. And maybe that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a haul to ask of our theory, but we should at least try. and. Maybe at worst case, what we can do is say, OK, these sorts of animals are, and I'm going to put this in huge scare quotes, in a one universality class or a different universality class or a different universality class. And so we can have different sets of models. Or even maybe there's a more continuous spectrum of things. I'm not saying any of these things are actually true, but we'd like to be able to write down theories where we could figure this out. So, what I, so I'm going to talk about today is how do you actually think about this? And how do you make choices? So we're going to sort of be working, sort of thinking about that pipeline as we move, over, as we move through the day. So I'm going to try and leave that up there. And hopefully my board work will accommodate. Um, and really, so there's, whenever you come up with a representation, right? this is about building a representation of data. Right? We don't necessarily have a nice, clean picture like we would have, say, an, oh, a base pair sequence or a neural, neural firing. But, but the idea is we want to be able to try and have some sort of way of actually talking about what's going on. And so there's, this intrinsically is going to depend on the question we want to ask. Right? We want to be able to have this <coughs> representation. And really, so the three things that, at least to my mind, 
that are the big challenge here is one, what I referred to already, how to represent posture, how to go from some measurement of an animal and describe its, its configuration. So I'll be using this phrase configuration space. That's just a fancy word for how, are all the, how is all the animal's body parts located in its own frame. So when I say configuration space, think the animal frame. Okay. So how to represent posture. The second one is how to perform a mapping between those postures and dynamics. Right. So we had this nice Langevin formalism before. But that's going to be a lot more difficult when you have more than one variable you're we're referring to, and those variables aren't independent from each other, and it becomes a royal mess. So that's not to say it's impossible, but it, for the first thing one would do, it's not likely to work super well. And three, what can you do with it? Right? And that's really where a lot of the value judgment comes in. In, sci in science, we tend to have this repulsion towards the idea that we're making value judgments when we're making measurements or making decisions. But we're making those all the time. We're making choices. We decide we want to measure this thing instead of that thing over there. And that tells us something about what, what we're actually going to find. Right? I'm going to decide I'm going to measure this thing over here at this scale with this amount of smoothing, or I'm going to leave my shutter open for this amount of time on my microscope. And this, very, and this allows you to ask different questions and say different things. And so how we're going to actually want to do these things is going to depend on what are the questions we specifically want to answer. Because we're going to do this in different ways. So I don't know what everybody in this room would want to answer. But I can just tell you what I was trying to do when I was thinking about a lot of these things. And what, I'm, and what I really wanted to care about is what does an animal do? How does an animal spend its day? I wanted to understand how does an animal go from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing to another thing? Is that a set of sort of discrete hops? Is it continuous? How does it move through this landscape of various, various things? And can we have some understanding and make some predictions of the physiological processes underneath it? So, for example, like what we saw from the worm data yesterday, you saw as the worm got hungry and hungrier, you saw that the noise winds up getting suppressed so that it winds up going in a straight line. And this points out ideas as to what might be actually happening in the nervous system. They may be wrong, they may be right, but at least this gives us some predictions. Ilya. Yeah, why, why do animals, what, what's this? No, I mean, I, exactly. So I think we're, f again, physicists, we want normative theories. Right? We want to understand something about why, why the natural world or what are the physical principles underlying commonalities or dissimilarities between organisms. And that's the goal. I'll, if I talk about the thing I'm planning on talking about in lecture four, we'll see one example of this. But I think right now we're so poor, you, in order to make a normative theory, you need to make a, a descriptive theory first. Right. You, can't, you need to know what you're actually going to measure. Right. And, so that, and that's exactly what I, what I ran into. So I started this project thinking about it as a postdoc. And I really cared about understanding how do long time scale structures emerge in behavioral sequences. What are the things that actually wind up occurring? And then thinking about maybe why. And what I ran into very quickly is that in things more complicated than a worm, there wasn't a good way of even measuring behavior in the first place. Greg? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why does a fluid flow? Well, because there's symmetry properties. Can right. we tell you how a fluid flows? No, we, yeah. no, you can tell you why. Because we believe in conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. And so if you believe in conservation of energy, momentum, and mass, right. if you make some assumptions about the fact that it's flowing in a particular way, then you can write down Navier-Stokes equations. And you can, you can, for simple cases at any rate, 
you can write down analytically, and for, comp for basically anything else, you can do a simulation. Right? So in some sense, we know why the fluid flows. There's another question about why fluids exist in the first place, and even then we have some answers because we know something about very relative binding energies and things along these lines. So I think for a lot of physical systems, we do have something like that. Right? Navier-Stokes equations just to write, arise from writing down symmetries. Galilean some invariance and all these other things. If you just say, ah, these are things that we have a very good empirical evidence for. If you say, why do we have Galilean invariance? Well, we don't, but like, oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so then that, that's, where, that's where the level of the difficulty, I think, comes in. But we're so far removed from those fundamental things that I think that that's a, I mean, it's, it's always a great point. Yeah, Sam. Yeah. Um, well, that was the long story short. That it's particularly when I was working on it, that was the only real option. I mean, particularly for an animal as small as, say, a fly, right? So you could put motion capture beads on an animal, and even for rats and mice, this is very complicated because they tend to like to bite them off and other things. In fact, there's one of my collaborators uh, does actually puts body piercings on rats so that they actually, actually keep the, mark, the motion tracking on. But yeah, so I mean, I think just the natural way is like, what, what are the other options? I mean, it would depend. Like if I was looking at bats, I might care about echolocation or something. Like, but given the animal I was looking at, and for a lot of practical reasons, we, we started with flies partially because it's something I actually knew a little bit about. And second of all, they're easy to deal with in the lab. You can get a ton of data. And really what we wanted to work on was a system where this approximation of infinitely amount of infinitely good data wasn't so far off. We were at least sort of in this Taylor expansion regime from that. Right? It's, sort of, it's sort of the goal. And so that was sort of, and that and there were people around me that knew how to take really good images. So <laughs> make good friends, theorists. <laughs> yeah. And, mm -hmm, yep. um, no, we didn't. We, we, did, we did something to their environment. Okay. So, I, I just go back to my question. When you subtract, how coupled do you think the different behaviors in different organisms are? If you suppress one behavior, do you think that is going to make the switch cell less small or something like that? I mean, so the, that's always the problem, right? So, when I'm going to refer to these things, and what we're going to talk largely about, uh, both today and, uh, and tomorrow is like what I call naturalistic behavior. Well, I, don't, I didn't invent the term, but this is sort of the term I prefer, is naturalistic behavior, which is to say there's this paradigm. On one side, there's this paradigmatic behavior where you just have this animal. It's highly constrained. It can turn left. It can turn right. On the other end, you have the animal in this natural environment, which you can't really control anything, and it's really hard to get measurements. So naturalistic is sort of in between. You sort of know you're getting rid of stuff, but the animal is at least making its own decisions, and it has a vast majority of its behavior repertoire available to it. Now, in these experiments, what's actually what's being done is there's a little dome on top, and, the f and you put an optically clear uh, lubricant on the top so that it can't climb on the ceiling, and, so, and it won't generally fly because it's maybe about twice its body height. Every once in a while it will, but it's pretty rare. So, but for flies, uh, my experience in my whole PhD was studying insect flight, and flies hate flying. Despite it being their name, it's, they lose half their body weight if they fly for an hour. Like it's a 200-fold increase in their basal rate. So they don't fly very much. So if you're just watching what it's usually choosing to do in a situation where there's no danger around, they generally won't, unless they start getting really hungry. Yeah, no, I mean, these are always questions, and I think we always have to present most of these stuff with the caveat that this is naturalistic behavior. And we could do something in ideal world, we would be able to do this in the natural environment, but that's not always a practical thing to do, especially if we want to write down theories. And maybe the second point to make is that if our theory depends so much on all of the details, then maybe it's not a particularly good theory. So we might, we, maybe there's some small per perturbative correction on one side, but really what we care about is thinking about isolating these general principles and by sort of restraining ourselves in this way, sort of trying to do this balancing act. But no, this is precisely something that we care a lot about and people in the field think a lot about about what this actually matters.
that, I mean, that's a whole other set of questions and very interesting ones. But I think that for now, for the questions that we're asking, again, what next? Right? For the questions we're asking, we're about trying to think about things which are about what are the internal states and what are the things which are driving these longer time scale structures and behavior. And we find out that we see them even in the simple environment. So this, this aspect is maintained, and so if we can understand it in the simple environment first, then maybe there's some hope. And there's a bunch of really cool experiments where people are doing stuff with GPS tags of animals in the wild, and so Ian Cousin over in uh, Max Planck and Constance has been doing amazingly beautiful work on these sorts of things, but that's a whole other can of worms that I'm not gonna be able to get to today. Yeah, no, excellent question. Good. Anything else? All right, great. So, so basically what we're going to try and do is figure out how to do these three things. And as I've mentioned, we're going to make a couple of assumptions. One, we're going to say, we're going to say we have an, let's say the cardinality of our data is infinitely large. Right? We, have, we have as much data as we possibly could want which sort of makes this thing that sort of in the back of our heads, and this is a practical thing, but we should think about it to a certain extent. Any algorithm everything should scale like n or maybe n log n. Right. Because we're going to have a huge amount of data we're going to try and say something about. Right. If we have an algorithm that scales like n squared, it just never gonna, we're never going to be able to do anything. So just sort of keeping this in the back of our head when we're thinking about practical concerns and doing these calculations. Right. Sort of the, the theoretical data analysis equivalent of just deciding do I really need that extra term in the Fourier series. Right. Right. And, but in general, other than that, we're going to assume that for the data, all of our technical hurdles are gone. We can measure whatever it is we want. From, from we can extract whatever information from the images or from whatever we're measuring we want. And so now how do, what do we do with that? So let's go back and think about this. And what was, th what was the first thing? And I'm going to sort of go through this on the chalkboard, and then I'll show pictures in a minute of what's actually going on, uh, and sort of just to give this visual uh, consolidation of what you're seeing. But if we're going to think about from the worm, what we thought about the worm, what was the very first thing we did with the worm? Sorry? Well, okay, you segmented it from the background, right? That's one, right? So we segment, so we did some image thing, and we said, okay, this is background, this is, this is worm. Okay, what, so what was the second thing then? No, that was the third thing. What was the second thing? Well, I guess sort of it was the, I guess finding the center line was in some sense the second thing, but what do we do to that center line first? What, what it, we had, we had invariants we added to deal with, right? Right, so we, yeah, we had to rotate it, right? So we had to basically, so there we had angles, so we didn't care about translation. So here the first thing is we're going to have to do some sort of, segmentation and alignment. So we're going to take those images of the fly, and so it basically, again, what that's doing is saying, if I'm doing this behavior over here, I'm going to call it the same behavior as what I'm doing over here. And that's an assumption. Right? That's saying that I don't, and in fact, if you actually look to see which behaviors are performed where in, in this dish where the fly is crawling around, you see that certain behaviors are more likely to be performed near the edge than in the middle. So you don't actually have translational invariance, but it's a way of, t this gives us a way of talking about what the animal's doing in a way. And so then we can say, ah, this behavior is happening out at the edge more than in the middle, but we've defined, if I'm doing this behavior, it's the same thing in both places. And in practice, what we do is, like, I don't want to get too much into the detail of this, because this is rather technical, and there's, this actually isn't what a lot of people need to do anymore. But the point is, is that you can do some fancy image processing to do this. Right? Now you can just write a neural net and it does this reasonably well. And then you can also do an alignment. And what you generally do is you can align it to some basis image, which looks like sort of a digitally ablated fly, where you take away the wings and the legs and everything. 
And this is actually, it is some sort of fun math. You have to use polar Fourier transforms and cool things like that. But, but that's the first idea, is we do this alignment. And in practice, this isn't what we really do. Now, so, and so we do that now. But so then the second thing is, we need to go from those aligned images to this, to this high D representation of posture. And so that's going to be some form. Like, in an ideal world, this is going to be some form of tracking. So what I mean by tracking is that like, you say, OK, here's the tip of the front right leg. Let's get our fly back up here. All right. So here's our fly. You can get the tip of this leg here, and this can you track that? Can you find where its location is in every frame? No. Really, until about maybe a year and a half ago, this was not really possible to do, especially because, honest to goodness, some of these data sets are a billion frames long. So even if you're 99% good, 0 0.001 times a billion is still a very large number. You can't, like, basically, human involvement has to be essentially zero. Actually, it has to be exactly zero. And so actually doing this tracking, so in, instead of doing this tracking approach, which wasn't really feasible until recently, what you would do is, wh so what we did is we figured out something a little bit different. Right? And so what we essentially did is we did what I would call an image compression approach. And what this means is, I'm not actually going to draw a fly because I can't draw, as was noted yesterday. But so you have one image that looks like this. You have another image. I'm sure there's some topological transformation between this and a fly. Um, <laughs> and so, and so, and so then you have a, and you have a bunch of these images. And what you're actually going to do is you're going to treat these. So one of my postdoctoral lab mottos was images are data. So which the idea is we're going to literally treat that uh, to be the case. So each one of these things is some, is some vector of images, right? So uh, some vector of pixel values. And this is something that can be done very robustly because we can do the alignment very well and we can do the segmentation very well. And then, so then once you've done those two things, you basically can just, you can, take the image data itself and do your usual thing of calculate the covariance matrix and diagonalize. And then from here, you get your eigenflies to crib Greg's uh, eigenworm term. Okay. So the idea is essentially what you're going to do is you, you have all of these pixel data, right? And you've got millions to billions of these things. And these are high dimensional. Say this is a 200 by 200 image, so that's a 40,000 dimensional vector. But it turns out when you do this, you get a, and if you were to look at the eigenvalue spectrum of this, and so here's sort of mode i, and let's make this a log. log of i scale, what you wind up seeing is something that drops off, sort of like that. So you get this smooth drop off, which tells you that you don't, which in sort of this sense of dimensionality reduction, because you don't have like a bunch of nice little dots, uh, where it just sort of truncates beautifully like you saw with the worms yesterday, this tells you you probably are in some weird high dimensional space where you can't actually measure the dimensionality well, or it's nonlinear. And so fitting a plane to your data, which is essentially what this is doing, doesn't work super well. But which one of these in this case, do you know? Sorry, what? Which one of these in this case? It's both. <laughs> I mean, so what you can do is you can, I mean, you can actually explicitly try and measure the dimensionality of this. This is always fraught. But you can measure the dimensionality of it, and you can at least put a lower bound at 10. So that's. So it's hard to, just as a practical matter, and this is an aside, like it's really hard to measure the intrinsic dimensionality of something which is greater than 10, because if you think about it, right, what you're generally doing is you're measuring the volume of things. 
in some high dimensional space to measure what that dimensionality is. But the number of points you need to convince yourself that there's enough volume in there is going to grow exponentially with the number of dimensions. So it's really hard to actually convince yourself that something is really much more than 10 dimensions because you run out of data super quick. But you can sort of say it is high dimensional. And also, you, if you actually look at certain projections, you can see a lot of nonlinearities. And also, there's a bunch of density fluctuations. So this isn't some like nice, uniformly projected plane. And honestly, the eigenworms weren't either. right? You saw that that was a nonlinearity in that, too, because the first two eigenworms really looked like a circle. So that was really more of a one-dimensional thing that you had to put into 2D if you're doing this with PCA. All right, so. The point of doing PCA here isn't that you're beautifully capturing the posture in the best way you can. Honestly, the best way of doing that is just by, frankly, tracking. Particularly in the case of a fly, because it's a very, a fly is a pretty rigid creature. There aren't too many continuous degrees of freedom in the end. Well, there are continuous degrees of freedom, but they're, they're basically a bunch of rigid links put together. It's like some engineer's dream of a bunch of th uh, four link uh, apparatus, four link apparatus. So essentially what you wind up doing is this. And we'll see the pictures of what these eigenflies look like in a minute. But I sort of wanted to run through this on the board first. Yeah? What is I? I is just the mode number. So basically this would be, if you have 40,000 dimensions, this would be going from 1 up to 40,000. So that's why I put it on a log scale. And this drops off pretty precipitously until it sort of cuts off. You find out that, like, you can do a shuffle test. You can shuffle all of these things and you get some line, some spectra that sort of looks like this. And so you can sort of say, all right, let's arbitrarily cut off at that point, which is a pretty conservative number of, which is a pretty conservative cutoff, meaning that you're probably including more dimensions than you actually need. And if you wind up doing that with these data, what we got was, unfortunately, exactly 50. Like, I wanted this to be 49 or 51 or something to show that we actually did something, but no, it was 50. And so basically we have, what we have from this, after, after doing these sorts of things, is we've created low D time series. Right. So and we'll call those y1 of t, y2 of t, in the case of the fly, all the way up to y50 of t. Okay. And those are just the projections on the eigenvectors that you get from these things. And the exact same thing as the, eigen, as the eigenworms that we saw yesterday. But now there's, instead of four of them, there's 50, unfortunately. So these aren't going to be super interpretable. And you'll, you'll see what these look like. It's really hard to actually figure out what exactly these are doing, but we can still try and sort of soldier on and figure out what's, what's occurring. So now we have time series, now what? So what we did yesterday with the time series is we looked at them. And so first of all, we saw that there was this phase dependent, so we could reduce it even further to this 1D problem. And then you did this Langevin model. Right. Now, like, what was great about this, right? So we had, so, so we have these various time series. That's y1. Y2, so say Y1 of T does something like that. Y2 might do something a little bit different. And we have a bunch more of these time series as well. So what we did last time right, is for the worm, we were able to do Something looks like this. Right? We were able to write down this Langevin-like dynamics. But this really required us to have this nice one-dimensional phase variable. And being able to convince ourselves, I mean, and if you wind up looking at these things, they're, and if you, can, you can plot them against each other in the same way that I was showing where you plotted eigenworm 1 versus eigenworm 2 against each other yesterday. 
And it's a mess. There's no beautiful structure that pops out. It doesn't really look like there's any major sort of interesting structure within any pairwise thing. So you, I think you're really stuck in this higher dimensional structure. So then the question is, what can we do? And where we can be inspired by this is also thinking back to the worm. One of the things that came out of that analysis was this, right? So when we were looking at the reversals, right? So we have, we had phi versus t. And we would see things like this, where we'd have these reversals, where you go from the forward state to the backward state. And when we plotted and we sort of histogrammed out, OK, if here's t equals 0 and t equals like minus 6 over here, and here's phi. And if we histogrammed what that looked like, we got something that sort of looked like that. Right. So we had this. We had this notion that this wasn't random. We had this behavior that was occurring uh, in this very typical sort of way. And this is what we'll call our stereotype behavior. So these are when you have your dynamical structure where the behavior is occurring frequently and repeatably. So it happens a fair amount of the time. And also it happens, when it does happen, it's pretty consistent. We're going to call these our stereotype behaviors. And in lieu of being able to actually write down an explicit differential equation, maybe the better solution, or at least just a solution, is to try and can we have some sort of a representation of a how stereotyped, so how stereotyped, Is our behavior? That's one. And then two, how if we, if we do see stereotype behavior, can we find our repertoire of stereotype behaviors? And by that I mean what's the collection of the total behaviors that you have? And then how often do you use them? And then on top of that, can you look at how the animal is moving between those different sets of stereotype behaviors? And this, to me, so this is where I think I put in sort of the most, this is where my sort of intellectual contribution on this was, where I made sort of the strongest choice. Right? When we're asking about what's next, right, I wanted to really understand what, what it was about these long time scale structures. How does the animal live its day? Is it, and my hope. And looking at this and sort of just intuitively having watched animals my whole life is that the stuff we do on the, for the most part is pretty stereotyped. Right? There's this, again, I made the Ministry of Silly Walks joke yesterday. Uh, but it's the same sort of thing, right? There's a reason why that's funny. Right? It's funny because it's patently ridiculous. There's all these types of movements we can do that we're capable of performing, that we're within whatever the high dimensional space of coordination that we could theoretically live in, but at the end of the day, what, winds, what actually winds up occurring is you see the same sets of things occur over and over again. Right? Walking across a room like this is a very common gait that you're going to see. I'm not going to go all John Cleese on you and do a standard thing up here because I'm just not nearly that type of performer. But, but I mean, but that's, but that's, a, that's the sort of idea is that Maybe this is a way of trying to understand the fact that this behavior might discretize itself in an interesting way. But we'd like to be able to make sure that the data actually tells us that it's discretized. Right? There's a lot of ways we could do this by trying to say, oh, let's break up the data into chunks and see what those chunks are. But really, we want to see whether some type of structure emerges naturally. And that's going to take some work. And really, the type of work it's going to take is a combination of time series analysis and dimensionality reduction. And in, rea so, and in particular, what we're going to imagine, right, is so imagine we're just going to look at their first, just because I can only draw up to three at a time. Let's imagine I've got my three, my first three eigenvectors here. And then I'm going to look at our projections onto those, right. We're going to look for sort of these trajectories in this space, which you see very commonly. 
And there's probably also going to be a bunch maybe that you see less commonly all around. But in some sense, this looks like kind of a density peak, where we see a bunch of things that are all sort of clustered together. So we're going to try and keep this in mind as we design further things that we're going to move through. Right? Trying to understand what exactly, how can we find these things, which is really hard in a high dimensional space to do explicitly. And so we're going to try and do some sort of tricks to move around that. First, I'm going to tell you something that doesn't work very well. Because I think by telling you, okay, this is the title of the talk, Mistakes Are Made. This was a lot of time spent wasting on thinking about this process. And so, but I think it's a useful thing to go over because of that, because it's sort of the obvious thing to do. So idea one, just find motifs. So what do I mean by that? So what you're basically going to do is so let's, I'm just going to draw two time series for now because that's a little easier. But just imagine there's 50 of them. So I've got, so this is t. This is y1 of t. And this is y2 of t. So you have two different time series. And what I'm going to try and do is isolate sequences. So let's say I've got some sequence of length L. Right. Now I'm going to try and s isolate these sequences explicitly in the, in the data that we see a fair amount of the time. So you know, this is y1 of t, right? So we can write this down in terms of a convolution. If we're going to write this down in a convolution, we can say like chi i. T equals something like this, where this where this is uh, this thing is whatever that sort of sort of basis thing we're looking through, right, with a bunch of zeros padded to either side. Then we sort of pull that through the data set. And where chi i is large, so you can imagine writing down an algorithm, and there's a bunch of these MK algorithm, things like this, where you can actually go and find what's the, if I pick a length L, what's the, what's the best motif? So what are the, what's the sequence in the data which has the most, which are the most common, the second most common, the third or the most similar, the second most similar, the third most similar, and so forth. And so then you get a set of motifs which move throughout the data set. Okay. And, so, and the idea is maybe you can find these particular motifs. So if we're measuring, say, and then say, for example, what we could then measure is, say, say a chi total of t. And just to be dumb, we could just say, just the sum over all possible, over all of our time series. So we're going to take, find what's the convolution across all of these different things, and then find what is this common motif across all of them. And this could be negative. So, and the idea is maybe you get something which looks like that, and you have some line over here. Say, ah, OK. The motif is being performed there, it's being performed there, and you can find some magic way of drawing what that horizontal line is. So there's a bunch of problems with this. So I should note, actually, this has been used to some degree of effectiveness in the worm. But again, because the worm has uh, some nice low dimensional properties where this is more, more readily available, fly doesn't work so well, or in more things where you have more than this one degree of freedom. And so wh what's the problem? Right. So one, we had to we had to choose L. Right? So we had to choose the length of this thing we're convolving with. There's not, and it's very difficult to get around that. Right? So we can pick a different bunch of lengths and find a bunch of things, uh, each for a different length. But then it winds up being this huge computational mess, because you don't know what size. And maybe these motifs are quite long. 
It, I didn't say at what scale these stereotype behaviors should be. Right? That's another point. Right? It's one of, this, one of the things we saw in the worm is that there was this notion that this forward versus reversal had a different time scale than the time scale of the behavior itself. And so we have basically this trying to figure out what are actually these time scales of the structure, and we don't know what those are a priori. That's problem one, which is sort of the most philosophical. Problem two is there's bad if slight phasing. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is if you have two sequences and they sl are slightly different, like imagine one of the things is moving at a slightly different frequency than another one, then all of a sudden, because of the destructive interference, it winds up going to zero. And so this measurement, this sort of convolution, then basically sets everything poorly. And or kind of related to that is that nearby frequencies are missed. So say, for example, that I had a, um, a two sine waves that are my stereotype behaviors. One is, one is at 20, 20 hertz, and the other one is at 24 hertz. You're, because, of the, because of the phasing, basically that convolution is going to go to zero very quickly. So you're not actually going to measure anything. So the, those are sort of three things. Those are three key aspects, and it turns out that this winds up. Now, you can fix this a little bit by doing something called dynamic time warping, which is basically a mapping from one onto the other. Uh, basically warping, it's exactly what it sounds like. You take this thing, you're warping time from two different sequences onto each other, but this winds up being for a data set of a billion points long is just not feasible. Winds up, again, winds up being n squared for that long and that's done. So we need to come up with a different solution. And so idea two, is let's move out of the time domain and move into the time frequency domain. So instead of thinking about time and length over here, let's try and think about time and frequency. And so everybody here knows what a Fourier transform is. And so what we're going to do is basically construct a spectrogram, which is essentially, you can view this as a time windowed Fourier transform. So that's going to look like, I'm going to use this notation. So basically, this is a Fourier transform with these two components, but you're windowing it by this Gaussian, <coughs> which has a width sigma. So essentially, what you're doing is you're moving through your data set, and you're taking this Gaussian windowed average over what the Fourier transform is. This, and so this is generally called a short time a short time Fourier transform. And in general, what we're going to try, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at the amplitude of this guy. And we're looking at the amplitude because obviously this is a complex variable that comes out of it. And by getting rid of that phase information, we're, at, we're eliminating a bunch of these type of phasing problems that we see over here. 
Okay, so now, if two things are similar frequency, they're actually going to be very near each other in terms of their spectral representation. But there is still, so this isn't quite right, though, because there's one thing which is still a problem, which is the matter of time scales, right? We had to pick the sigma, right? if you all remember, right? So essentially what we're doing, we, how you can view this is we take a window of sigma, we calculate a Fourier transform, we move over, we take another window of sigma, take a Fourier transform. That's obviously not exactly what we're doing, but you can conceptualize it that way. And so essentially, so what we remember from, uh, from our good friend uh, Heisenberg and others, right, is that when we're doing this, right, is that our resolution in frequency and our resolution in time is or on the order of one or is it a constant. And analytically, we can understand this because the larger the window of sigma, the more data points we have, so then the more frequencies we get out. Think about this if you're doing a fast Fourier transform. The longer your time series, the more Fourier modes you get out of that. Um, and then, but, then, but then now you have worse time resolution because your sigma is longer. Or if you have a short sigma, you have fewer points, so you have a bad frequency resolution, but your time resolution is good. So you pick. This is time, this is frequency. We essentially get boxes which more or less look like this, where we have this would be sigma, and this would sort of be roughly 1 over sigma on that axis. And the problem with that is, again, over here, we don't, we don't know at what time scale our behaviors, quote unquote, are going to be. Right? So we need to be able to actually look at this across a bunch of different frequency spectra. So we might want to try and, so I th this is closer in that we've gotten rid of a lot of these phasing issues, but we still have this problem about how do you actually incorporate multiple scales, right? That was one of the things we mentioned yesterday about what was so hard about animal behavior, that there's multiple time scales, multiple length scales. So doing these types of decompositions helps with, with the length scale aspect, but now we need to figure out how we're going to do this multiple time scale aspect. Fortunately, there's, there's some math that's already been developed for us that is rather nice. And so we're going to talk about the wavelet transform. And I promise there'll be pretty pictures at the end. What we're going to think about is and in particular we're going to talk about the wavelet transform of the continuous variety. Right. So there's also a discrete version of this which is super useful for computing images and in fact any JPEG image compression is based off of discrete wavelet transforms. But what we're, I should say, JPEG 2000 image uh, compression, but uh, which sounded high tech at the time. Um, but so we can basically see that what this is doing is it's a way of uh, creating these multiple scale approaches. So mathematically, we'll have the same sorts of things. So we have some time series x of i, again, t. Now instead of referring it to an at in terms of our frequency f, we're going to refer to it as a scale. So that scale is going to be a time scale we're going to be looking at. And so one can imagine that by some clever inversion of S, you can get to what your frequency scale is going to be, and that will we'll show how that happens at the end. And how we express this is in terms of this integral. Where this, where the psi here is what we call a mother wavelet. And so we can, there's a bunch of different things and that one can put into that. And we're going to talk about a particular type. Right. And we're going to talk about what's called a Morlet wavelet. And in that case, we're going to, which is defined as psi of eta equals there's 
just pi over 1 fourth for normalization factor that gets out there, minus e to the minus, I'm sorry, e to the So essentially what this is, is this looks pretty similar to what we saw over, over before, right? So we have a Gaussian here, and we have this Fourier-like looking term here. So if we plug this in to the overall integral for, we, we explicitly put in the Morlet thing. So this is easy because this is the only imaginary component here. So if we take the conjugate, is equals 1 over root s This looks almost identical to, the previ to what we had over here. Right. So over here, we had this in terms of we had a over 2 squared, and we had this Fourier component here. So here, this is exactly the same because we've replaced the sigma with an s. But now, the only difference is now we're dividing our Fourier term by the scale as well. And so what's essentially happening is we're scaling our frequency. So at different scales, we're looking at different frequencies as well. So as we look at longer, as we look at longer time scales, right? Now we're going to be also looking at smaller frequencies. So, so in effect, now what we've done and how you can sort of conceptualize what we've done here, is we can take the same plane. So here's T, here's F again. We can again, we have still, we're still stuck with this. Right. This, this is an inc incontrovertible fact of nature, right? We're stuck, or at least of math. Right? We're stuck with this. This delta t, delta f is roughly a constant. So we have this long thing here. But now, right, this box is the same area roughly as those boxes. But now at a low, f we've moved up in frequency. And so we've increased our time resolution but we've decreased our frequency resolution. And similarly, we can do the same, same deal. Something that looks like this. Okay. And so essentially what we can do is we can tile our time and frequency resolution in a way so that we're looking at so for low frequency, like if I have a two, if I have a one hertz signal, I don't need to have one millisecond resolution of that. Right? I need roughly one one second resolution of that. So you want to have a long time scale. Similarly, if I have 50 hertz up here, then maybe I want to have much better time resolution. But in order to do that, I have to trade off my frequency resol resolution. And this omega naught term is actually what handles that trade off. In a particular way, usually people just use two pi because that gives a direct analogy to the Fourier transform. And so lastly, and just sort of this is a note, is that you, can, you need to be able to translate that s to what the frequency that corresponds to. And you can do that essentially by passing, if you imagine that your x of t that you're passing in is just some sine wave, you can maximize the response of this, of this transform to this particular sinusoid you're passing in, and then basically solve that. And if you do, you wind up finding your frequency is a function of s equals omega naught plus 2 plus omega naught squared all over s of f over 4 pi f. So you can then move easily back and forth between the frequency and the, and the scale. And so now you can actually put in, and usually what, because of this type of scaling, you usually put in sort of this logistically spaced set of frequencies in. 
And so now what we have is we can put in our time series. Right, so now we have as a function, and this is, I promise, the last thing before we, well, so two more things. Only, only, well, only if you're a, uh, only if you're a theorist, <laughs> right? Um, so the wavelets, so the lo the mathematical logic behind them is they can form a complete set. So you can represent you can represent any function with them in the same sort of way. So that's, but the logic behind them is you're representing them in a way which is kinder to multi-scale phenomena. Oh, presumably you could do it the same way. The math would definitely be harder because Fourier trend, you don't have, it's not quite as nice of a basis set. But you could do it in the same way. But usually when most people have differential equations, either you have a single time scale or your time scales are very, very far apart, at which point you can then do method of averaging or other sorts of interesting things to, to sort of separate out those two time scales. It's less common to see more of this continuity outside of maybe chemical reaction systems. So, so that leads us to exactly what our data is, or our, what our data are. Right. So we have, so for each of our time series, right, so for our y1 of t, so here is time, and we'll have frequency on this axis, and we're going to have some, again, we're going to look at this magnitude of w. We're going to have some wavelet transform. Same thing with y2. F and T is going to have some form and all the way down to Y50. So how do we want, so we have these, f and we have some number of frequency channels in each of these things. So what we're going to effectively do is draw a line, right? At each point in time, Let's say I've got NF. I chose to calculate this thing for NF frequencies for each, for each channel. And I've got 50 channels. And so let's say NF equals 25. It doesn't really matter so much, but it's, it's a nice round number, and it captures enough of the description. Right. So at each point, I've got, 50 I've got 50 time series. And I've got 25 frequencies I'm measuring from each time series. So my, so I'm going to have an overall vector, we'll call it z, <laughs> and this is an element of 1250, so that's, because it's 25 times 50, I have a 1250 dimensional vector. Okay, we've made our life easy. <laughs> right, but, but now, so but the idea is, what, we're essential, what we've essentially done is you represented space and time. We have each one of these in some sense represents space. But ideally, if we, if we did this properly, if we were able to actually track everything, each one of these might have been one joint angle. So that's saying where on the animal is moving. And then this frequency is telling you wh what, what speed is it moving? And, and or what are, the, what, are the, like, what are the types of speed at which it's moving? And we have that at every single point in time. And that was part of why we use this continuous formalism. And so now we can actually move this as a function of time, and we have this continuous function that we can try and decompose. And now our, our challenge becomes, how do we take this vector, and because, uh, because I'm a theorist, I'm going to do something which is, uh, sort of, which is ambitious and potentially stupid, and we're going to try and take this down to a two-dimensional system. <laughs> because we can. So how might one think about doing this? So idea one. Right? So again, I'm going to show another bad, another bad idea. Right? And each one of these things, I'm going to try and show at least one bad idea that I had, and then say why it's not a good idea. Right? So idea one is to do, ah, that's better clustering. 
what I, what I mean by that is that now let's say, let's say we have our 1250 dimensional data. I'm going to draw some 2D projection of that. So let's say our data points sort of live like this. We're going to write down some algorithm that will say, ah, here's a cluster, here's a cluster, here's a cluster. And then these are our stereotype behaviors. This, doesn't, this winds up being problematic for a few reasons. Anybody have some, and there's, a, there's a whole zoology of these algorithms that do this. So what, but what are, what are some of the problems that some of you might imagine occurring from this? Yeah. Well, let's say I'm doing this in the full 1250 dimensional space. I'm just showing this because I, I, I lack the artistic talent to draw in one, let alone 1250 dimensions. So. Yeah. Right. So, well, yeah, that, that's, the practic so that's the practical thing about this is how do you initialize it. But that's the big one is how many, right? Well, how about what's the metric? Yeah, metric well, yeah, we're going to do that, right? So how many? Well, the metric is going to be always a question, right? This is always a value judgment you make. So and no matter what we do, and we're going to make a value judgment in a minute there either. So that's an estimation, too. Okay, yeah. But even though that, that's a choice, right? Um, Right. How many, right? So any, so you'll see a bunch of people which write down these types of algorithms that, uh, that they'll say, oh, well, we have some Bayesian prior which tells us how many clusters you're going to find. There's always some parameter hidden in there, right? There's always some, some aspect of this prior which is going to come out with the right number, with some number of clusters. You could have some sort of an AIC, BIC argument of nested thing. Well, yeah, yeah right, that's the best case, right? Right, that, that's three, right? That's the, right, so three is, are there clusters? <laughs> right, I, as what I said before, right, when we were talking about this initially, we wanted to see whether a discrete representation even made sense to begin with. That, that's exactly right. And so that, that to me was actually the most fundamental thing. The other things are more technicalities. Right? And this is something, and by the metric, so just to be clear, what Greg was referring to is how do you call like the difference between, the, how do you define that these two points are different versus the same, right? And that's just putting a metric on the space of 1250 dimensional points. And, and so, and, and also there's actually a fourth thing as well. It's assuming that all points, even if there are discrete behaviors, all points belong to a behavior, right? So you're saying, generally in most of these things, there could be some sort of fuzzy clustering where you're deciding it could be part in this set, part in another set, but you generally have to say that all of these points belong in some cluster. So how do we, how do we proceed from here? Let's, let's erase our mistakes. And so the notion, the notion sort of that, uh, that I came up with uh, well, in, in coordination with other people was this notion of the behavioral. Yeah, Bustle. So why was I sure what? Sorry, I'm having a hard time. Well, you don't, right? So that's why, so we're going to have to double check this. Right. So my, my inclination on these sorts of things is to do something and then check it, right? So we're, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do something. This sort of, there's some philosophical problems why we don't like this. So we know at the beginning we're not going to like our answer, right? There's other things we can do where maybe we can try something and see if we like our answer afterwards. So that's what we're going to try and do.
Right? But that's always a question of how do you, whenever you have an unsupervised approach like this, and this is sort of to tie into what David was talking about yesterday, this is a really an unsupervised idea, right? We're trying to find structure within a data set um, that's sort of self-supervised. I actually do like that term a lot more than unsupervised, right? You're trying to find what is actually the structure in the data set which maybe is supervised by what, uh, what aspects of that data you'd like to, what you would like to see from it. Right. So the idea too is make what I, make what we call a behavioral map. And so here, the idea is you have some high dimensional time series structure and this frequency structure somehow gets mapped to a bunch of points and maybe there's a bunch of nearby points which are sort of nearby times you go around this orbit. And maybe there's this other orbit over here and each time you get something which gets mapped over to something like that. And maybe there are even some other things which are sort of, sort of singletons sort of lying around. And then once we have these sort of locations, we can sort of look at flows within this space to see how these different behaviors or the different orbits are moving between each other. This is this notion of the behavioral map. So how do you construct it? Right. It's a very easy thing for me to say, but it takes quite a while to think about how actually one might do this. And oh, what are the things we want to preserve is so one, we want to preserve sort of clustering structure. And then say if it exists. Right. So if we want to say if we do have clustering structure, we want to make sure that this thing is actually able to be preserved. Then two, we want to be able to say we want to keep far away points far away. All right, so if two points were initially far apart, I want to make sure they stay roughly, they stay pretty far apart. We don't care exactly how far apart, just that they're far away. We want to really focus on what's this local structure. And it sort of is a side note, if you were to try most of those dimensionality reduction things you might have heard of, like principal components analysis or, look, or isomap or a bunch of these other things, which it doesn't matter if you don't know what these are, but what most of these do is they wind up, they're very good at making sure if I have two points which are very far apart, I keep the distance as far apart, uh, I keep that distance relatively constant, and then I do all sorts of warping in the middle in order to make that happen. You know, sort of do the opposite. We want to say, if I have two points which are close together, I want to make sure those local relationships are preserved. But if they're far apart, I don't care how far apart as long as they stay far apart. Okay. Yeah? Well, we haven't decided said what space. But yeah, no, it's a choice. Right? It's a choice of saying this. This is a choice, and this is saying, it's think of any dimensionality reduction as compression. What you're doing is you're throwing away information, going from 1,250 down to, say, 2. And you're throwing away information in order to do that. And so the question is, what information? And what I, the information I'm going to want to throw away is, I don't care so much if these points are 10,000 points. 10, let's say 1 is a relevant distance unit. I don't care if these points are 10,000 or 11,000 apart. That's not something I care about preserving, but I care about them being 0.1 or 0.2 apart. So that's basically the value judgment that's being made. Right. Any, all of this stuff is value judgments. But there's things we're trying to discern from the data. Uh, people will try and make, whenever you talk about these sort of things, like there's some magical set of algorithms which, which lay at your feet exactly what you want, but at each point you're making scientific choices in the same way you decide to set a microscope at a particular magnification. Right? You're looking at different things. So what we're going to do is do something which some of you may have heard of, which is called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding or sort of colloquially T-SNE. Right? 
And what this winds up doing, and there's other methods which have come along since then which, does, which do similar things, but we're just going to talk about this because it's the easiest to write down the math for. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's say we have PIJ, right? So PIJ is essentially, we're going to do a random walk on our data set. Right? And it's the transition probability between one point and another point. And that's going to be proportional to this Gaussian. Right? So you're going to be moving only to very nearby points. And as a practical matter, you sort of you do have a parameter you're going to tune. And you're going to set the sigma i for each data point such that um, your entropy of transitions, j of minus pij log pij equals some constant c. Okay. So you're basically going to set the sigma, sigma i in order to do this. And this is just a simple sort of linear, uh, linear search algorithm. So you're basically going to look at your, how you can interpret this as you're going to be transitioning to your sort of roughly n nearest neighbors with some probability. And this d is the dimension in the high dimensional space. So what you're going to now do is you're going to say, what's my, so this delta ij is your, is your this is your distance in low D space. Okay. And now what you're going to define is another distance, QIJ, which goes like 1 plus delta IJ squared to the minus 1. So this is the, to us, to me, I would always call this a Cauchy distribution, but they call this a T distribution. Okay. Basically, you have this, you're now, and the reason why this has to have this heavy tail is otherwise everything collapses down into the middle. So that's why you have to have this long-tailed Cauchy distribution instead of a Gaussian. And what you're after, so you normalize this. So essentially, you're going to find y star. And that's going to equal the arg min over all possible y's of a kobach leibler divergence between your PIs and your QIs. Or written out. Basically, this equals the argument over y, sum of ij of pij over n times the log of qij of my set of y's divided by PIJ pi divided by QIJ over my set of Ys. So there's a bunch of stuff here, but basically the, the general idea is that note how this cost function is, has this PIJ out front. Right. So if that PIJ is essentially zero, right, so the points are, usually, are initially very far apart, it doesn't factor into this cost function directly. Right? You're only really paying attention to the points which are nearby. Unless like, it sort of gets in the way and then it sort of takes, eats away from the QIJ of this other term. So you really are paying attention only to these nearby things and disproportionately ignoring the far away ones. And then you actually have to, how you actually minimize this is a real pain. And what sort of the technical stuff we had to develop is how do you do this for, how do you make this scale like n or at least how, at least n log n. I'm not going to talk about that because that's not conceptually interesting, but it took a lot of work. <laughs> All right. All right. So for the last 10 minutes, we're going to actually see what sort of the results of this look like. 
So again, here's our little fly. Is there any questions before we? Yeah, Basel. If what? Can, can you can yeah? Can you tell whether the embedding is good or not? Yeah, yeah I'll show that in a second. Great, okay, great question. Great. So we have our fly, and what we're going to do is we're going to do alignment. So this is what I was referring to alignment. So you have the fly running around, and then on the left, and then on the right, you've segmented it from the background. So that's the white part of the fly, which has now inverted the image, and now you can sort of see more or less it's always pointed exactly to the right. Now again, we can do fancier stuff. So this is some work from us and other people where we can now actually using convolutional neural networks, we can do a lot of this tracking. And Greg has had some really cool stuff in his lab doing this as well, um, looking at kind of how you can actually do some very complicated limb tracking problems. But when we were developing these things, that wasn't an option. So we did this, again, this is this principal components analysis thing where we just lined up all these images. These are what the eigenflies look like. So red would be positive and blue would be negative. And all these things dotted with each other is, a, is zero because they're all orthogonal. And we get time series out of that by projecting onto those eigenflies. Yeah, Greg. You don't have, I mean, we don't have to, no, but it's, I find it's more interpretable, especially, I'm more interested in a lot of questions involving how you bridge the length as well as time scales now. And I think if you actually have postural, honest to goodness, postural information, that's valuable. Now, there's a question about whether you actually need that for these algorithms, and in effect, what oftentimes works better is you take the postural components, you do a PCA on the postural components, and then you do this, because there's too many correlations between them already. But... I think that's more of a technical thing. So you don't think there's a, you think it's always useful to have these kind of interpretable, you know, joints that angles that we have. Always, I, like, I always recoil a bit from the word always, but, uh, but I think that it's, for me, is coming from a biomechanics background, it makes me feel better, <laughs> right? It makes me feel like I can actually say something about what, at the end of the day, uh, why we're doing a lot of this is to say something about what the animal's underlying control algorithms and underlying structures are. And so if we can actually pull this back to the movement of a limb, then that gives us some extra hints. Yeah, you get similar results. Okay. I mean, you could, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, you could do the exact same thing. And in fact, I think Josh actually did do this for, no, I don't think he actually wound up publishing it. But yeah, so you can, you can do this for the fly data and it basically looks the same. Does, it doesn't change how the behavioral spaces wind up looking. Then we take these things and we do our wavelet transform on them. And sort of note again how you get these nice long, this is time and then frequency. And so we know how you get these long sequences over here on the bottom. And then sort of you get these short, narrower things at the higher frequencies. So you're getting this multi-scale structure. From there, we do this embedding. So here is sort of my gratuitous movie of or how TSNE is working. And you can really see, like, this is complete toy data. But you can see you have these set of clusters over here on this left, the left side. And then on the right side, you can see that sort of, like, these two points, like, all the things within a cluster have maintained. But, like, this, this, and this used to be very far apart. But now they're close together, but not so close that they intermesh. So actually run this on our data. And we get this. So it's fun to do a plot with 26 million data points on it. Um, and there's a couple things to notice about this. First of all, it's clumpy. Right? It's not, that's a technical term. Uh, it basically means that all the points are, like, it's not uniformly isotropically spread across this thing. We can see this if we convolve it with a Gaussian. You get these nice peaks and these valleys in between. The other thing to notice is that we ha these are each point, and each point on here is one point in time, right? That's what these feature vectors were, or one point in time. So we can see how it's actually moving in this low dimensional space. And if we do that, we get something interesting, that it'll sort of stay one spot for a while, then move quickly. Stay one place, move quickly. So this sort of sit switch. 
And we can see that intuitively from this time series of the x and y coordinates in that space. But we can also do it more formally by sort of plotting the speed or histogramming the speed. This is a log scale. And you can see that the two peaks are separated by two orders of magnitude. So it really just sort of stays one spot for a while, then moves quickly. Stays one spot, then moves quickly. Yeah, go on. In this 2D space. Completely arbitrary, hence the lack of units. It's just one over seconds. <laughs> um, and so we can say, basically, here's this thing. Let's take that little thing in the corner and say, let's pull out a bunch of random movies where it gets mapped to that and it stays there for a little bit. So it's in that left sort of staying peak and see what the fly is doing. So there, the flies are all running. Or up there, they're up in the top right. The flies are all grooming their head with a slight left asymmetry, if you look really carefully. And down in the lower left, that peak, the flies are all grooming their left wing. So we went through all this work, but we, we now have this thing, this, this behavioral space, where we have a bunch of peaks and valleys in between. And what's also nice is not every point in time is a stereotype behavior. Because when you're in this fast moving stage, how you can interpret that is those are things where it's not doing something which is a typical stereotype behavior. It's not well represented within this 2D space. So as a result, we have roughly half of our time the animal is spending these stereotype behaviors, the other half is these non-stereotype behaviors, and we can use this way as a way of representing uh, structure. The last two minutes, so, and sort of just as a, we're we'll gonna get more into this next time. One second, Liam. Uh, we can see that um, like there's an overall structure to this space. So we can see the locomotion is in the lower right, posterior movements, so towards the back is in the lower left. Not doing anything is something, which is always comforting. Um, that's in the upper left, and then like head grooming stuff is in the upper right. And to get to Vassal's question earlier, can I answer yours in a second, Liam? Um, I'll skip the gratuitous movie. So one point I would like to make is that we can say, okay, did we make a reasonable decision? So one thing is, so here's four different dimensionality reduction things on the same data, and you can see that Tisney had sort of the, this nice effect of preserving the local structure in a very low number of dimensions, where other approaches didn't. There's other ones now that can do roughly as well, but this, is, but this was certainly at the time that we were doing this made the most sense. And you could also try and do this in three dimensions. Right? And what, what's interesting about this is you can actually compute this KL divergence, exactly like what Vassal was asking, and you can say, well, should I have put this in three dimensions instead of two dimensions? And Sure enough, you do a little bit better. So your error, so your total entropy of this P distribution is roughly 20 bits. And your error here is 3.3 bits, and over there it's 2.9 bits. So it's like a 2% overall increase in uh, capability. So because of the analytic capabilities you can do in 2D, we decided to stick with that rather than go to 3D. And just sort of intuitively, the 3D sort of looks like the 2D, but sort of curled up a little bit. And the last thing to decide whether you think it's good or not, and this is what I'll end on, is, again, we want to say, did we construct things in this high dimensional space that look like these stereotyped orbits? So let's actually go back and check. So if we go back to this lower right, this is actually the fastest running that we see the fly do. And we plot, so this is just plotting two of the modes against each other. So this is mode seven and mode eight. You can see the eigenflies up to the left. That during this behavior, it's and plotted against each other is in the upper right of this is you get this sort of in-plane sort of limit cycle, at least, you, I guess you can't say limit cycle, but at least periodic orbit looking structure. So that's comforting. We can actually do this in a higher dimension. And so that's just one behavior. So here's five different ones. So right wing grooming, left wing grooming, running, abdomen grooming, and uh, head grooming and plotting the first three eigenfly projections, if you average across a bunch of these together, you can see that each of these are actually representing individual periodic orbits. This is the average, or this phase average curve. Uh, we do some fancy stuff with the Hilbert transform and other things to pull this out, which I'd be happy to talk about later if you have questions. Um, but more specifically, you can look within the running area and find what are sort of the structures that you would see for data within that area. And 
The general topology is you go from faster, so this is the frequency that the fly is moving its legs, from faster to slower, and so colored, and so the colors match over here, and you can see sort of the average trajectories across these different modes, and you can see, for example, as it goes faster to slower, like this one, the amplitude decreases as you go slower. This one is one of my favorite ones because you can see you actually go from, as you get faster, you get the second phase coming up across the orbit, which means that the fly is moving from a tetrapod gate to a hexapod gate. So you can actually see a qualitative change as you move through these things. This tells us we actually have captured something about these intrinsic stereotype behaviors. And now as we have this, now the question is what to do with it. And that's what we'll talk about next time. Sorry, Leah. Sorry for... Well, so I mean, so th that's always a question. And that's, that's always, that was always a result I fought against um, sort of publicizing too much with any of these, is like you look at these maps, right? So in order to, let's, let's move backwards. Right. You look at these maps, right? So how we got from here to here was through convolving with this Gaussian, right? What I didn't say is I picked the size of that Gaussian. So one could do a bunch of things to then cluster this space and do other things with that. So some of the peaks have very obvious ethological interpretations. Other ones don't. And oftentimes, a lot of the things we pull out, like we were able to pull out some subtle differences that you can see once you're told, but no one would have found if they were actually looking at them, if, actually, if, like if you weren't looking for them initially. So you can do these sort of forward screens. Um, Part of why I like this representation is you don't have to rely on the fact that they're clusters necessarily. You can treat this as a sort of this two-dimensional probability density field. And you can do an analysis on that 2D field, which as physicists, we know, we know how to deal with 2D probability density fields. This is, this, this is something we're well trained in. And so that, that, having that set of suite of analyses available to us, I find more powerful than being able to say, oh, there's 100 or there's 120, because that's just a function. That's a very detailed function on what I pick for that smoothing window here. Yeah. It's very similar. So I'll talk next time a little bit about, so you know, we'll talk a bit next time about actually the work of Richard Dawkins, who before he was Richard Dawkins was a uh, fly grooming expert, believe it or not. <laughs> I kid you not. And so we'll talk a bit about him next. And so if you look at his papers from the 1970s, where they're looking, they look very similar. I mean, there's always going to be slight differences. And in any field where there's talking about discrete behaviors, there's always the, what they call the lumpers versus splitters arguments about how many different things I have care usually. It's more about do I have a representation that I can do something with. And so, but I show this to an ethologist and they say, yeah, it sounds about right. <laughs> that's, that's, about, that's, about <laughs> that's about the extent. And then every once in a while I can show them something that surprises them that it's obvious once it's shown. Yeah, Russell. Do you see like, similar features for both? Do you see some, what? No, you can do it. In fact, there was a recent paper from Andy Leifer's group which actually did this. I didn't, Greg, did you ever do this yourself? You, you, I did. you can without some additional. They, they yeah. Did. They, you, they, but you but it doesn't look like this. It looks much smoother. And there's an important step that Gordon made along the way, which was to ignore the phase information among the, yeah. among the wavelet variables. And that's really important for the worm. So you have to add that back in. Yeah. And, and that's part of why we did the, the, this limit cycle stuff here as well, is because we took away that phase information. That sort of made me intrinsically nervous that we had lost something important. Uh, but for the sake of practicality, it turns out because, of, because the phases move much quicker than the actual behavioral changes in the fly, it winds up not being a big issue. Yeah? Yes. I was sort of hoping somebody would ask, ask these things. Uh, so here's a couple examples. So here's an example of a mouse, <coughs> for example. So this is 
some data of a mouse running around. This is a lot less data, so it's a lot smoother. Or doing my dog's favorite behavior. And you get these type of structures. Or you can look at, so I have another, I have data here of these prairie voles. Um, so these are these animals that form these monogamous pair bonds, and they're desperately, these are two pair bonded animals desperately trying to get across each other. And so we can do similar types of maps as well for that. Um, I even have some human stuff as well, um, which is usually my good ending joke. But uh, <laughs> All right. other questions? Because it's been